Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and in today's episode of AWS we will be discussing about AWS regions, availability zones and IAM. So without wasting any more time let's get started. So as we all know that AWS or Amazon Web Service is a cloud service provider and they provide you with servers and services that you can use on demand and scale easily. So there will be some place that they will be storing these services, right? So when we talk about that, we need to understand that AWS region is nothing but a geographical location. And each geographical location is a combination of one or more isolated locations. So what exactly it means is AWS regions are separate geographic areas that AWS uses to house its infrastructure. These are distributed around the world so that customers can choose a region closest to them in order to host their cloud infrastructure there. The closer you are to the region and the closer the customers are to the region, the better so that you can reduce network latency as much as possible for your end users. That's one of the most important thing that you want to remember when you are a solution architect. So in AWS regions perspective, there are some services that are region scoped. For example, AWS RDS, the services that are regionally scoped cannot be accessed globally. So you have to log into the particular region and then you can access the server or the service. So other than that, we have globally scoped services, which are like IAM, S3 and Route 53. So IAM basically is your identity and access management, which we are going to discuss very shortly. And S3 is your S3 bucket. So they are basically globally scoped. When you want to determine an AWS region, so these regions are basically denoted by US East 1, AP South 1. One, US East 2. So the notation for AWS regions are basically like this. So AP South 1 is one of the regions where in India we have the center for Mumbai. So one more thing that is really important for us to remember is AWS regions are completely independent and resource replication isn't possible unless and until you specifically specify that. So until then, until and unless you specify for it to be replicated, it won't be having any replicas across any regions. It will be specific to that particular region itself. So let us log into the AWS console and we'll see what are the regions that we have. So I'll just quickly log in and I'll enter the password. So well, it is asking for an MFA code, isn't it? It's great, isn't it? We'll see this how to create it in the IEM part or the IEM section that we are going to cover. So let's just do this. Let's just enter the MFA code. This is basically the multi-factor authentication. So I'm just using Google Authenticator to basically enter my MFA code here. And that's it. I log into my root account now and i'll see like uh, here when you click on this ohio drop down this is basically the regions drop down you have us east north virginia us east ohio and all the other things right let's suppose i click on iam and i select iam actually so this is what global scope means that iam does not require any region selection and uh, basically like once we go back to services and we click on ec2 ec2 is region specific that is why you can choose a particular region where you can actually select or create a particular ec2 instance so that's what i wanted to show you guys so let's move forward so if suppose regions are not having replication so how to achieve fault tolerance and how to achieve high availability so as i already said that each aws region is a combination of one or more isolated locations these isolated locations are basically called az's or availability zones so each availability zone is a physical data center in the region and it can have one or more data centers as well so each availability zone that you see there can be like multiple availability zones in a particular region they are all separate from each other they are all isolated so so there can be situations or scenarios where one of the availability zones gets closed or fails due to some like unforeseen situations like a, a calamity or an earthquake so what we need to do in order to achieve high availability and fault tolerance is to host our instances in multiple availability zones. In that way, we actually prevent failure from a particular single point of contact. As the instances are spread across multiple availability zones, even if one fails, the user still will be able to access its data. That's one of the biggest advantages of using availability zones. So as a solutions architect, you would be having the responsibility to make sure that your data or your instances are being put or being hosted in different availability zones and they are having a region that is closer to the customer so that they have lower latency and high performance. So just like AWS regions are denoted by US East 1, AP South 1, US East 2, availability zones also have a naming convention like US East 1A, 1B. So let's suppose the region that you specify is US East 1 and it has 
two availability zones so that will be denoted by us east 1a 1b and that goes up to f talking about local zones local zones are also an extension to regions but basically what local zones do is local zones provide you the ability to place resources such as compute and storage in multiple locations closer to your end user so if you know that uh, end user of yours is really important and they want specific resources to be placed near them then you can opt for a local zone and place it next to them so what are the best practices while choosing a region and being a solutions architect this is really important for you so the first point is proximity so when you choose a region you must make sure that it should be close to you and your customer this will help you optimize network latency and thus increasing performance so the second thing is services so while designing the application you may have come up with your own architecture and you know what are the basic services that you need for your application to run and we need to try and think about what are the most needed services for our application Usually what happens is some of the new features or the new services get released in a particular region then they move on to other regions so you need to ensure that you know what are the main services that you need to have for your application so these are the things that you need to keep in mind before designing the application or while designing the application itself the third thing is cost obviously cost is really important to us and certain regions will cost more than others we can use the aws calculator to do a cost estimation for us so that we can choose the right amount of value that we need for a region and in that way we can optimize cost as well so the fourth point is service level agreement and just like cost service level agreements actually change or vary with region just like cost that i discussed in the previous point so you need to ensure that you understand what your needs are and if they are being met or not so the fifth one is compliance and compliance is one of the most important aspects of product development and basically because sometimes what happens uh, some of the features that you have may not be accepted in some of the regions and they may be accepted in other regions as well so what you need to do is you need to meet the regulatory compliance guidelines by hosting your deployment in some specific region or in multiple regions so as a solutions architect you need to remember all these five points and need to ensure that you meet all the requirements necessary for your product and the architecture that you have so we have discussed the theories about regions and availability zones now let's see how it actually works so let's suppose you are a user you are sitting and chilling of course and you are the customer and you want to access your resources that resides in a particular region and as i said the region is basically a geographical location and each geographical location is a combination of one or more availability zones let's pop up our availability zones so these are our availability zones and as i said i have mentioned here us east 2 and uh, each availability zone will be denoted by a character that is a suffix to that and uh, just like us east 2 us east 2b and us east 2c so each availability zone is in its own way a powerhouse of resources so as you say so each availability zone is also a combination of multiple data centers and this is where your application runs and availability zones are basically isolated from each other but to ensure high availability and fault tolerance we must host our instances across each of them so even though one of them fails in a natural disaster other two can help you get the response back that's how we achieve high availability and fault tolerance in this but having said that availability zones are isolated to each other to in order to achieve data replication or resource replication they are connected with low latency fiber connections so that our data can be replicated across availability zones and this is one of the beautiful features of availability zones and aws regions because if one of the data centers or one of the availability zones fail you have other two from which you can access the resources so one of the major advantages of using aws is its global infrastructure and the jaw dropping part is the way they have spanned across the whole globe and when you see that it's so much astounding that they have literally a region in literally every single place that you can imagine it's not that huge right now but they are still expanding so they have a region for asia they have a region for north america south america europe australia and there are some of the upcoming regions as well one for spain milan jakarta and cape town as well so currently there are 69 availability zones and 22 regions there are a few more coming up in the next couple of years so and let's move forward so one more thing that you need to remember is one of the special regions is called SAR or serverless application repository that is basically a managed repository for serverless applications. 
So finally, we have reached to AWS IAM or Identity and Access Management. So what exactly IAM is? IAM Identity and Access Management enables you to manage access to AWS services and resources securely. So there are a couple of things that we need to understand before jumping into IAM. So the first thing is the first identifier basically is the IAM user. So IAM user is like any other user that you have uh, that wants to access basically the uh, AWS account. So as an ID person, what you need to do is you need to create the IAM user. Uh, so IAM users are basically users who have authentication like they'll have a AWS uh, ID, they'll have a AWS username and a password using which they will be able to connect to the AWS management console. And uh, there are like a different type of users that you have. One is the root user basically which who has created the AWS account and uh, the administrator user which is different from the root user but has uh, full access to the AWS resources and services. And uh, there are multiple authentic authentication levels also for a user so either it can be using a SSH key or a access key or by using the like the normal credentials that you have the username and password and one more thing is to enhance the security that we have we have the multi-factor authentication that is for highly privileged users and uh, the next thing that you need to remember is IAM groups so let's take an example of WhatsApp so in WhatsApp we have groups isn't it so what do we do in groups we create a group give that a name uh, let's suppose friends party and in that we add users so uh, the admin is able to add users to the group and he is able to moderate the group as well and he is able to or the admins are able to change the, the name of the group or the dp of the group and they are able to manage the users on which user can be deleted from the account or the group itself similar to that im groups are also a collection of users or uh, aws users uh, which have different type of permissions or similar type of permissions based on the policy that you attach to that particular group so let's suppose there is a AWS S3 policy that you attach to the group. Every user that is inside that group will be able to access AWS S3. That's why it's written here that groups let you specify permissions for multiple users, which can make it easier to manage the permissions for those users. And the third thing that you need to remember are the permissions, policies and roles. So policy, as I said, uh, like you attach it to a particular group or a particular user so that they can access a particular Amazon AWS service or resource. So these uh, policies are written in JSON. JSON basically is a JavaScript object notation. Uh, you can go and learn JSON if you feel like because we will be using it for uh, configuring the policies. Role is different from a user because roles are attached to a particular resource. Let's suppose EC2 or S3. Permissions are like identifiers to a particular user and group that determines basically they can perform a particular activity or not. So let's jump in and create our first user. So before creating a particular user, I just wanted to go through some of the root user facilities that we have here so let's suppose this is a root user that i have and if you go to my security credentials i'll tell you something that you need to do before creating or after creating that uh, root user you need to go and you need to delete the access keys that you have created so i have deleted mine that I created and this access key was created one time and I have saved it and it is no longer used and using this I have created my admin user so one thing that you need to remember after this is once you have created this and you just need to delete it and just throw it away so once you create an admin user or any user you will get a login URL which you can use and you can sign into that particular user and I'll click on sign in I'll not save this so now I'm logged in to my AWS management console and this user basically has all the privileges to all the services and resources that we have for AWS. So now what I need to do is if I need to create a user, I need to go to IAM. So basically this is what helps us manage our AWS resources, isn't it? So we'll click on this. So once you come here, you just need to click on users. I have added one user also for myself and I'll show you once again how I have done it. So click on add user, you can give it a name I'll give this. So I want him to have a programmatic access and AWS management console access as well. Uh, I'll give it a custom password and uh, I don't want to have Amazon actually ask me to create a new password again and again. So I'll just uncheck this and that's it. I'll click on next. Now I can basically use this option or a checkbox to add him to a particular user group like admin or developer what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new group for you guys so let us create a new group called devops and i want devops to have a s3 full access i'm going to type in the policy that i want to have so this is the policy this is how the policy looks like the effect is allow 
action is s3 star which means all axis and resources star means all resources so what you need to do is you just need to select this and create group so now i have created a group devops who has full access to amazon s3 so now what i'm going to do is i'm just click, going to click on next because once you have selected a particular group in this list and you're creating a new user it automatically gets added to that particular group i don't need to add any tags right now just i'll review this username is jack access type is programmatic access and uh, console password type is custom because i have entered the password manually and permission boundary i have not set any permissions right now just to show you how to create a group and a user i am just creating this and let's create the user yes we have successfully created the user and this basically will give you the url to which you can connect and below that we'll get the access key id and the secret access key which is basically a secret so i cannot share it with you and please don't share your access keys with anyone that's it i'll close this tab that's it we have added three users now one is the admin one is developer and one is devops so let's suppose what happens sometimes is in your organization let's suppose john is working in your organization and he wants to access aws s3 or amazon s3 bucket he may not have access to aws s3 because there is no policy attached to john's account so once you attach i am policy he will be able to access amazon s3 that's what we saw right now like i added a particular user and i attached a policy to it and he was able to access amazon s3 and similarly let's suppose there are two different users other than john there is jack and josh uh, both of them are also not able to use aws s3 so what we can do is we can attach the same policy to the those as well those users as well and they will be able to access uh, amazon s3 bucket so there are three users right now and it's pretty simple and pretty easy to for us to attach a policy to each of them there is no hard thing that is going on here but let's suppose there are hundreds of users what should we do then so what we need to do is we need to create a group and in this group let's suppose i have created a group here like dev group and i have added john and josh into that and i have attached i am policy so now what happens is uh, they are able to access the amazon aws s3 bucket because the policies are attached to it so jack being in the admin group he is one of the jack of all trades and he is able to access the amazon aws ec2 so as you can see here dev group does not have access to aws ec2 that's how we have defined the policies like dev group will have only access to aws s3 and the admins will have access to creating uh, instances for ec2 and similar way let's suppose i want to eliminate john from the team or he got fired or he resigned from the organization i just need to remove his account from the iam and it will get deleted from the group as well as from the policy so what are the most common uses of iam we have already discussed users we have already discussed groups we have already discussed policies and permissions and the next thing is roles so unlike users and group iam roles are again objects created within iam which have policy permissions associated to them but however instead of being associated with users as groups are roles are assigned to instances at the time of launch so let's example a role can be attached to ec2 let's suppose for a root or an admin so that it can perform permission based actions on that particular ec2 instance one more thing that it's very important to remember is you can set user password policies let's suppose uh, you you want your password to be uh, of a length or specific length like 8 characters or 12 characters and you want your passwords to expire within 90 days or 120 days you can specify those things in user password policies multi factor authentication uh, it's like using extra security for your login so basically once you enter your username and password uh, it will ask you for a security token that uh, you can use any third party application like google authenticator to get a, a security token and then you can enter that token in that login page and then it will allow you to log into the management console and api keys or cli keys so as i already told so if you don't want to log in through the ui and you don't want to perform operations from the ui and you want to perform special operations or uh, actually you want to access the resources from cli you can use api keys or ssh keys or secret keys to basically log into that particular resource and use it so you can click on activate mfa in order to set up your multi factor authentication for your root user so we'll go ahead and click on this and the three things that you see here is one of choose virtual mfa device or choose u2f security key or choose other hardware like mfa device so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use virtual mfa device where i'll set up a application on my phone so that it gives me an authentication and gives me a security token to basically 
automatically log into AWS. So I'll click on continue and basically you can use Google Authenticator app. So I'll use the same and uh, I'll get it done. So you can click on show QR code and it'll show your QR code to you and you can basically uh, show that in your application and it'll uh, confirm that the same thing. So once you've added the account, I have added the account now. So what you need to do after that, it will give you a code that you need to enter. So first one that I have is and you need to wait for some more time so that it can give you one more uh, one more code that you have. Then you can enter the same and click on assign MFA. So I have got the second one as well. 741949 and that's it. I'll assign MFA. You have successfully assigned virtual MFA. So this has been a pretty long session, I guess, but it has been quite fruitful and it has been quite tiring for me as well to go through all these things and to get the slides ready. And it has been a lot of hard work. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do subscribe. And if you liked what we have got here, then hit the like button and please comment on the comment section below that what you liked, what you didn't so that it can help me give you much better content. That's it from my side today. Meet you in the next episode. Until then, signing off. Oh,